program. Before we begin, I'd like to share two exciting programs that we have coming up this upcoming month. So first, next week on April 16th, Michael Gerhardt, author of the new book, FDR's Mentors, and Andrew Bush, author of Reagan's Victory, will discuss three of America's most consequential elections, the elections of Abraham Lincoln, FDR, and Ronald Reagan. And then on April 29th, members of Meta's oversight board, Michael McConnell and Kenji Yoshino, will discuss the board's recent efforts to ensure free and fair elections in 2024. Our summer, uh, spring and summer 2024 season also include conversations on what it means to live constitutionally today, the idea of the American dream, AI, and more. To view our full calendar of events and register to join us for these programs, please visit constitutioncenter.org slash townhall. As for today's program, as always, uh, we'll collect questions throughout our discussion and we'll try to get to as many as we can to submit a question, uh, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try to keep track of those as we continue our discussion throughout. Uh, but now, to finally, to introduce our esteemed panel. So beginning first with Ronald Collins, he is the editor-in-chief of the First Amendment News. He previously served as the Harold S. Scheffelman Scholar at the University of Washington Law School and as scholar at the museum's First Amendment Center. He's the author of numerous books on the First Amendment, and his uh, riveting new book, which we're going to discuss today, is Tragedy on Trial, the story of the infamous Emmett Till murder trial. And Janae Nelson is the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She previously served in various leadership capacities at LDF, including as associate director counsel, a member of LDF's litigation and policy teams, and interim director of LDF's Thurgood Marshall Institute Prior to joining LDF, she was Associate Dean for Faculty Scholarship and Associate Director of the Ronald H. Brown Center for Civil Rights and Economic Development at St. John's University School of Law, where she was also a full professor of law. Thank you so much for joining us, Ron and Janae. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes. So, uh, so Janae, maybe beginning with you, uh, you know, reflecting on Ron's magnificent book, uh, you wrote the following. You said, the Till moment is an unending and pressing reminder that until we take the time necessary to confront this miscarriage of justice head on and address the unfinished business that the tragedy of Emmett Till and everything his murder and the acquittal of his killers represents, we will remain haunted. Why is it so important for Americans today uh, to know Emmett Till's story? Because the Emmett Till story, unfortunately, is a story that continues to repeat itself in society today. We know that there is a deep mistrust of our criminal legal system and that there are still severe racial inequities and that Black people are often not believed when they tell the truth about their circumstances. The Emmett Till story is a, a tragic one as the title of Ron's incredible book uh, reminds us. And it is so important in these moments when there's an attempt to erase history and, and recast it in ways that are uh, wholly dishonest, that we can look to primary sources like trial transcripts and know exactly what happened. And it's not really up for debate or interpretation. The words are there, the circumstances are clear, and it's a history that we must confront if we ever hope to uh, move beyond it. Excellent. And so, so Ron, just so we're on the same page, can you just tell us about Emmett Till and his murder? It, you know, in other words, you know, how do we end up inside a courtroom in Tallahatchie, Mississippi, in September 1955? Well, if I may, I, I just like to put a, a tail on the kite of what Janae just said. Um, you know, it is said that the dead live on the lips of the living, and it and it's true. Uh, and, and that is the, the the search for the truth can take decades, it can take a century, but we have to kind of commit ourselves to it. And I think by that measure, the work that you're doing at the National Constitution Center and the work that the LDF is doing is absolutely essential. And if I could just take a moment, I think it, this captures the spirit so much of what Janae just said. It's from the Ford to the book. It's by Congressman Bobby Rush, who was the lead author of the anti -till, uh, anti uh, the Emmett Till Anti Lynching Act, uh, which was signed by President Biden. So just let me just read a few words, if I may, because I think it's just so powerful. Um, he says, "In our human condition, rage cannot and must not exist in a vacuum. Martyrs must not be robbed of the catalytic catalytic power of their martyrdom." 
Martyrs, even the innocent and young, like Emmett, are God's instruments for his purposes and his shalom and our collective well-being. And I think that really kind of says it. And, you know, the, the search for truth, particularly when it comes to racial justice, particularly when there's so much going on in terms of attempts to whitewash history or kind of tone it down, what have you. And so I think um, this story, which is a remarkable story, it's a tragic story, but it also has an element of grace in it. So go back. It's August 1955. Emmett Till's 14. He lives in Chicago. He's, you know, a playful, happy-go-lucky boy like so many others. Uh, and he wants to visit his cousins in uh, in Mississippi. Uh, and Moses Wright, his great uncle, is there. They're going to take a train. They're going to go back to Chicago, uh, back to Mississippi, or go because he hasn't been there. And he's going to spend some time. And, and it's really exciting for him. His mother gives him a warning beforehand that Emmett, Mississippi is not Chicago. And she gives him quite a bit of a, of a warning. But he's kind of a happy-go-lucky guy. And so when he's in Mississippi, he's out there in the cotton fields. This is all exciting to him, right? Um, and they decide that they're all going to go down, several of them, uh, to a place called Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market. It's a very small mom pop sort of place. 90% um, plus of the people who patronize them are, are African-Americans. Um, and uh, while he's in there, uh, uh, he tries to buy some candy. There's some exchange of words. Um, and later on, when Carol Bryant, who's the, uh, her husband, owns, uh, owns, the, uh, owns the market, as does she, uh, when she comes out, Emmett whistles. There's no doubt about that he whistled. His cousins and others, Wheeler Parker, said that he did indeed whistle. They realized immediately it was, was very dangerous. What That was just extremely dangerous. And uh, so they flee very quickly. They made a tragic mistake, though. They didn't tell Mose Wright that Emmett had whistled. Because had they told Mose Wright, the great uncle, he would have taken uh, Emmett out of there immediately. Because he knew how dangerous that was. Anyway... Um, Suffice it to say, and I'm skipping over some things here, that in the middle of the night, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam, Roy Bryant, Carol Bryant, uh, the woman who was uh, uh, the object of the whistle, uh, her husband and her brother-in-law, J.W. Milam, come there and uh, pound on the door with guns. Uh, most right. Can you imagine? It's like middle of the night. He doesn't know what's going on, and they want to know where the boy from Chicago is who whistled. Uh, they kidnap him. I emphasize kidnap him. Um, uh, they will uh, brutally torture him before they murder him. Um, and then uh, a sheriff named H.C. Strider uh, uh, wants the body buried within 24 hours. And he has the casket sealed. And that under penalty of law, that casket cannot be opened, right? We all know, and we're going to get to the remarkable historic open casket funeral that Mamie Till had in Chicago in a moment. But suffice it to say that what she was doing is when she came, right, she comes from Chicago. Now, where does a woman who is not a woman of means first get the money to take the train, right? And then to have the casket to go back to Chicago. But she comes to claim her boy which means that um, she has to sign a statement that under penalty of law, she will not open that casket, nor will anybody who has custody of it. The body comes to Chicago, uh, the casket is opened, and some remarkable things happen thereafter. But let me just pause right there. Uh, the two defendants uh, had yet to be charged. There was a grand jury. They would soon be charged by say yet because the funeral in Chicago will be going on. But when they're charged, they're, by the way, they were originally arrested for kidnapping and murder, and they confessed to kidnapping. That's important, as we'll hear later. But in any event, I, mean, I just want to pause before we get so before we get to Chicago, because what happens in Chicago is pretty important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for teeing that up, Ron. And and, and to you, Janae, you know, as, as, Ron as Ron suggests, you know, Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till Bradley, she plays such an important role in this tragic story, as, as Ron said, choosing an open casket funeral for her son to, as she said, quote, let the people see what they did to my boy. Uh, Janae, you described her act as, quote, forcing the country to confront the evil of lynching by sharing her grief and her son's suffering 
with the world. Can you talk a bit about Mamie Till Bradley, you know, who she was, her courage, and the importance of her decision to have an open casket funeral for her son? Well, like so many uh, Black mothers, she became a, 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 a voluntold, a volunteered hero of our time uh, through the most tragic of circumstances. And I think she understood acutely how important it is for all of us to bear witness to the atrocities of racism and racist violence. And it's not terribly different from what we experience today when, for example, we all collectively viewed the murder of George Floyd and we see the videos of Breonna Taylor and so many others who are victims of violence motivated by race. What's really interesting and what many people don't recognize is that there was something of a template for this particular bravery that we saw Mamie Till um, uh, Bradley exercise. Just months before Emmett Till's murder in 1955, there were two Black activists in Mississippi who had also been murdered. Uh, Reverend George Lee, he was an NAACP field worker. He was fatally shot in the jaw at point blank range, uh, pulled over uh, in his car after trying to vote in Belzoni, Mississippi. And Joy Ann Reed uh, writes about this in her new book about Megger and Merle Evers and tells this story that many people are not quite aware of. And then a few weeks later, after George Lee's murder in Brookhaven, Lamar Smith was shot and killed in front of the county courthouse in broad daylight before witnesses after casting a ballot. And so what we see in all of these instances, the common thread is when Black people, whether they're children or grownups, uh, uh, traverse the hard lines of what's expected of Black citizens and white citizens. They are penalized in a very public way. And what Black people have chosen to do in a number of these instances, including Rosebud Lee, uh, George Lee's widow, is to say, you don't get to publicly uh, denigrate our humanity without us taking some agency in showing the evil that you visited upon us. So it's a very interesting um, uh, sort of role reversal in terms of trying to teach a public lesson so that Black people understand the place in which they should remain. And Black people saying, when you do this, we are now going to display your evil uh, clearly for everyone to see as a way to bring greater attention uh, to this, this scourge on our society and hopefully uh, come toward some remedy. So these are significant acts of bravery. They're acts of agency. Uh, they're acts of, of, of witness bearing and reclamation of our own humanity. Uh, and, and it's very important that we tie the thread among these various incidents uh, of history. These were really courageous women who chose to expose uh, the brutality visited upon their loved ones in this way and to great effect. So powerful, Janae, thank you so much for that. And can, I, can I just add something to that? I, I find myself in her shadow yet again. Uh, so first of all, and, and I was delighted that uh, Janae, you made a reference to uh, Joanne Reed's new book, Medgar and Murley, because there's a whole chapter in it about uh, uh, Emmett Till and, and what have you. But the the open casket funeral was so important, not only for the reasons that Janae just mentioned, which were the really important reasons, but there had been 500 lynchings in Mississippi before this. It all basically gone ignored. When Mamie Till decided to have that open casket funeral, it went international, all right? It's really what prompted the trial. Who knows if there would have even been a trial. This would have just been 501, another person, another black person murdered. So that trial is is really kind of it opens, in some respects, it one can see this, and if I'm off base here, Janae, tell me, but one can see this as the beginning, the modern beginning of the of the civil rights movement. I mean, obviously, Brown v. Board was extremely important, and and what what uh, um, uh, Rosa Parks did, but Rosa Parks was influenced by by what by the by this by what Mamie had done, and so this is so important, and I, and. I don't know if we'll have a moment or not, but I think there's two things that are important, that open casket and funeral, and the photographs of, close-up photographs taken uh, at the mortuary of Emmett's face um, by David Jackson, who was a reporter, a photographer uh, 
for Jet Magazine and Robert Johnson, the publisher. And when they decided to publish that in Jet Magazine, it also appeared in Ebony and Chicago Defender and other places. The only audiences for those were were uh, were black people. And I think the Jet Magazine sold 400,000 copies. And I will say this, when I was interviewing any black person over 50, and I would say Emmett Till, the first thing they would all say, Jet Magazine, yes. you know? And it, it, so the, you had on the one hand, the funeral that went international, and then the close up of the tragedy that was felt by black Americans throughout the country. And it was really, it was really that moment that kind of just catalyzed things in a way that they'd never happened before, at least in modern history. Now, Ron, I think you're absolutely right. That was a, a moment that really shifted the temperature in the country. You know, the Chicago Defender estimated that there were a quarter of a million people that attended the four days of public viewing. So this wasn't just a blip. This was a very intentional display of horror that was meant to instigate exactly what it did, which was a backlash against um, these the, these violent attacks in the South um, by, by white uh, people who had not been held accountable and still weren't held accountable, as we know, um, just to preview the outcome of, of the trial. Uh, but still, it raised awareness of this issue. And as you said, it motivated many like John Lewis and Rosa Parks and others to become civil rights activists. And it, as I said, allowed Black people to assert some control over the spectacle of Black death. And we could see, by the way, Tom, we could see this. You won't find this in any constitutional law book, but you should, right? This is the First Amendment in action, right? What they're doing, what David Jackson is doing with his photography, what Robert Johnson is doing with the publication, what Mamie Till Bradley, uh, later Mobley, uh, uh, is doing with that open casket funeral, this is all First Amendment work. It may not be a Supreme Court decision, but it's the culture, it's the First Amendment puts to work. And that's why I think it's so important. Absolutely. And I mean, Ron, maybe, maybe you know, moving ahead to the trial, which you so beautifully capture in your book, could you maybe paint a picture for us of the of the Tallahassee courtroom? You know, what would it what would it feel like to be there in September of 1955? Well, first of all, the defendants are only charged with murder. They're not charged with kidnapping, which is very significant. I mean, I won't go into the details, uh, but but so the courtroom, where do I start? I mean, it is First of all, uh, it seats 250 people. There's 400 people there, right? Uh, a few back rows are safe for uh, uh, Black people. There's a small little table that's for the African-American press. Uh, the uh, It's extremely hot. It's almost 100 degrees, very humid. Um, the defendants are sitting, I guess, about 10, 12 feet from where the witnesses are testifying. And they're smoking cigars. One of them is reading the newspaper. I mean, can you imagine this? I mean, a murder trial and somebody is there smoking a cigar and reading a newspaper. I mean, how how awful can it get? Meantime, there are two little boys who they were never in the presence of. They bring to the courtroom and they're running around the court with little guns, just kind of playing as if, you know, uh, during breaks a soda pop would be sold only to white people. Uh, and so there's this kind of almost carnival-like atmosphere. Now, mind you, uh, the judge, Judge Swango, did his best. At, you know, I mean, for a judge in 1955 in Mississippi, he was incredibly objective. But, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, and, and so that's what the courtroom looks like. And remember that every Black person who testifies, particularly Moses Wright, you might as well sign your death warrant, right? I mean, that's how dangerous, that's how volatile the situation was. And one thing is, is that the criminal defense lawyers, they had, there was a collection that had been taken to raise money to defend these two guys. Uh, and the, the prosecution did the best they could, but there was one big problem. They had 13 days to prepare and the sheriff had absconded with many of the witnesses and had them transported to another county and kept in jail so they couldn't testify. So that gives you a little sketch of the courtroom. Wow. Wow, that's, that's a very helpful context there, Ron. 
You know, Janae, maybe maybe expanding out a bit from here, you, you began to do this with one of your earlier answers, but, you know, uh, can you just place the Emmett Till murder in sort of the broader historical context here? You know, we're in August 1955 with the murder, September for the trial. You know, what's happening then in the nation uh, and within the civil rights movement itself? Sure. So, uh, you know, Ron already noted that uh, Brown versus Board of Education was decided on May 17th in 1954. Uh, so we know that the nation had already begun to recognize that separate but equal was not consonant with the 14th Amendment and the concept of equal protection. So there was already a, an awakening that uh, the way in which we were operating along racial lines was not sustainable. We also know that there was massive resistance. Nearly a year to the date of the Brown decision, another court case was required, Brown II, uh, that was decided in 1955, the same year, uh, that, that said these recalc recalcitrant school districts must move forward with desegregation with all deliberate speed. That is, you know, uh, in, in many ways, a very hollow phrase that doesn't provide any real timeline for uh, Southern school districts to engage in the, the important project of desegregation. And this, this sort of lymphatic instruction by the Supreme Court uh, allowed for violence to continue against Black students who were integrating these spaces. And I think also created the backlash uh, and, and the empowerment of, of people to continue violence outside of the school context. And we see that happening with Emmett Till, right? This 14 year old uh, child. Um, who who was penalized for again um, violating the the mores and norms uh, that were imposed on on black people and their behaviors? So that was the the very volatile condition of the South and of the country at large at that time. It was a moment of real uh, transition for for us as a democracy, and so it's not surprising that um, you know these events would be met with the the kind of forceful reaction that they were. I think Black people were also feeling more empowered about their rights and, and feeling that uh, they could engage in some uh, resistance of their own and, and a form of protest like Mamie Till uh, Mobley did here that was just uh, so searing and powerful. So it was a volatile time. Um, but not terribly unlike a time that we're in right now, where we see so many shifts happening and part of it resulting from uh, ongoing violence visited upon Black communities. Thank you, Janae. And, and Ron, you know, you, you've alluded to this already a bit, but I hope you make my drill down a, a bit further. Is you know, Could you just talk a bit more about the role of the African-American community uh, in the Till trial? And so, you know, including the role of Black witnesses at the trial itself, already talked about the Black press, but maybe a, a beat on that. And also others, like certain leaders like Dr. T.R.M. Howard, in protecting the safety of, of Black witnesses. I, I, You know, if a book hadn't been written about Dr. T.R.M. Howard, I would have written it. I mean, this guy is so, so important. And, you know, sometimes the people in the background are the most the ones that are really most important. You know, I mean, I sometimes think, you know, the fish take the water for granted, but, but it's really important. He's the water. Uh, a very successful um, um, and well-to-do uh, African-American doctor. He has a big home with a big fence, all right? So when Mamie Till Bradley came uh, to Mississippi, where did she stay? When the reporters for Jet Magazine and others, the Chicago Defender, where did they stay, right? When witnesses needed to be protected, where did they stay? They didn't stay in any hotel or any place near the courthouse, that's for sure. They stayed at the home of Dr. T.R.M. Howard, all right? That was essential. That was essential. And it really becomes this kind of communication center, all right? Um, Medgar Evers is there along with uh, uh, people uh, from the uh, African-American press, and they're going out into the fields trying to find witnesses, all right? And they're finding out what the sheriff has done, you know? I mean, the sheriff... The trial lasted, I mean, it took the jury 67 minutes, which included a, a soda break, to find the defendants not guilty of murder. Remember, they weren't charged with kidnapping. They were, I mean, they weren't prosecuted for kidnapping. But the real evil was the sheriff. The sheriff had, he testified for the defense, number one. 
he took the witnesses that they were able to get and moved them to another jurisdiction so they couldn't testify. He lies on and on and on again. He says that the body was so badly um, uh, 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 received when when, uh, when they first saw it that they couldn't identify it. We didn't know if it was a boy or a man or a black person or a white person, what have you. I mean, it was just one lie after another. He's working with the defense. I recently did a program with Jason Downs, uh, who uh, was uh, the lead, one of the main lawyers in the Freddie Gray case. And he told me, you know, he's done all of these criminal cases. You don't see a sheriff testifying for the defense. You just don't see that. And so that was such a, so much of an evil. The point is, is that I'm trying to get at is here. First of all, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, what he does is really important because it allows the press to be there. And they did find, they did come up with some witnesses that they were able to bring to court. And so that's really important. I think the other thing is, is that, and this is one of the things, the closing arguments in the transcript, which had been missing for a half a century, had never been recorded by the court reporter. I mean, it's just unusual, uh, highly unusual. The way I was able to reconstruct those in some summary form was primarily by going to the African-American press from the time. I mean, the, those stories had been lost for, for decades. And yet, when you kind of go to them piece by piece by piece and you put them together, all of a sudden, the closing arguments, which were horrific in terms of what the defense had made. So this was a trial that had to, um, It was it's the most seminal document from the time but it needed to be brought to life. And so uh, that's what I attempted to do here uh, in, in Tragedy on Trial. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, I, I just wanna underscore what Ron said about the importance of black press. And uh, there's a phenomenal black press archives at Howard University. Uh, it is often underrated as a primary source of these historical events. And, and Ron is right to point out that Black press often covered these critical events that national press would not and would ignore and didn't see as valuable or were operating, uh, you know, in a, in a very biased way in terms of what was newsworthy. So as we try to reconstruct history from the point of view of, you know, the victims of many of these events, it is so important to consult Black press. Um, and and I hope we do get to talk about some of the the really interesting um, other acts of bravery in connection with this trial, like Willie Reed testifying. And, and we only know through some of these accounts that, you know, he was persuaded by field workers at the NAACP to appear as a witness and, uh, you know, was 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 only 18 at the time. And, and as Ron said, it was effectively, you know, signing your own death sentence to want to appear in these in these cases. And, uh, the way that Black witnesses are treated or have historically been treated um, really tells you how compromised, how deeply compromised our criminal legal system is. Willie Reed, who was you know, known as Willie Lewis um, at the time, uh, was this surprise witness in the prosecution of these of these white men. He had no family ties to Till. He didn't know him, but I think he saw this as his civic duty and his duty to the community and, and just a moral obligation to explain what, what he knew about the case. And we know that that act of bravery um, really defied the standards of the time. Prior to the Civil War and in many Southern states, including you know Texas, People who were enslaved or free black people even were barred from testifying against white people in court proceedings. Their word was simply not valued. Uh, they could not provide sworn testimony. And um, the Equal Justice Initiative that Brian Stevenson leaves, uh, leads uh, reported that in civil cases between white parties and in criminal prosecutions of white people not charged with offenses against black people. So effectively any crimes involving white citizens, uh, black people had no right to testify in the court of law. Our opinions were simply not relevant or valued. And that carried over beyond just the witnesses in the case. Uh, you know, we, we often overlook uh, heroes like Constance Baker Motley, a woman who was one of the uh, early female attorneys at the Legal Defense Fund who litigated throughout the South in her career. And even as a lawyer in these cases, 
There was a refusal to acknowledge her, to call her by her name, to even recognize her value as uh, an attorney and an officer of the court in, in proceedings across the South. So recognizing the hostile environment in which these witnesses and their lawyers uh, were were uh, operating is is also a critical element to understanding the importance of that trial and what it meant at that moment. By the way, uh, consistent with what you just said, Janae, is none of the black witnesses were addressed by their full name. They were only addressed by their mm -hmm. first name, whereas all of the uh, uh, white witnesses were addressed by their surname, you know, and Mr. or Mrs. And and uh, and you're right in terms of what Willie Reed and Mose Wright. And at one point, Mose Wright during the trial stands up and he points. He says, "Those are the men. They're the ones that committed the murder," you know. And there was a photograph taken at the time in the courthouse. By the way, just a shout out, um, and I, I I I don't mean to put LDF and the National Constitution Center on on uh, on the spotlight, but let me do it anyway. It's long overdue. We have to, somebody has to honor uh, Robert Johnson for, for publishing that issue with that, that issue of Jet Magazine and David Jackson. To the best of my knowledge, they have never been honored for that. And I think, you know, the, that's such an important point, uh, uh, you know, in, and I, I would love to see them uh, recognized because, you know, the word, that's how the word went out uh, to so many people for so many, for such a long period of time. But no, there's no, my plea. <laughs> no, I, certainly, certainly. I, I appreciate that, Ron. Uh, you know, Jenny, one other thing to draw out and, and you know, came up in your, your exchange with, with, with Ron near the beginning is, you know, Emmett Till is coming down to Mississippi from a northern city uh, namely Chicago. Can you talk a little bit about just uh, the difference, uh, the differences in the ordinary lives of African Americans? If you're an Emmett Till in Chicago versus what he is going to, uh, or what he what he did confront once he got to Jim Crow, Mississippi. Yeah, I love how beautifully Ron laid it out in the beginning, um, where we can put ourselves in the shoes of Emmett Till and think about the excitement he must have felt going to a new part of the country, a state he had never been to, to meet family and frolic in ways that perhaps he wasn't able to do in Chicago. Um, and, and his mother, who did know the environment in which he was going, um, knew to warn him. And, and this is not to suggest that he did not face any threat in Chicago or that northern states don't pose their own uh, complications in terms of Black freedom. But his mother knew that this young man did have a different sense of self being from Chicago than he would in the South. I, I wanna actually read what she told him uh, or what she recounted that she told him. She said, I told him when he was coming down here that we he would have to adapt himself to a new way of life. I told him that if ever an incident should arise where there would be any trouble of any kind with white people, then if it got to a point where he even had to get down on his knees before them, well, I told him not to hesitate to do so. Like if he bumped into somebody on the street, well, and then they might get belligerent or something. Well, I told him to go ahead and humble himself so as not to get into any trouble of any kind. And I told him to be very careful how he walked in the streets at all times. And so think about a mother who already went into this scenario with some trepidation and worry, who knew that she needed to prepare her son for uh, the, the, the indignities that he would necessarily confront in Mississippi. So these days we call something like that the talk. You know, it's something that that many Black parents have to convey to their children, just as uh, Mamie Till did in 1955. And it is a talk that tells you how to navigate racism, how to navigate the threat of violence that follows Black people like a rain cloud. Uh, and you have to balance that in a way that does not require your child to forfeit their right to be a child, you know, their right to be imperfect, their right to be human, and to hold on to their dignity and a, and a sense of infinite possibility, but recognizing that there are circumstances where they may have to compromise that in order to live. 
and to save their lives. So it's a it's a paradox that has uh, really defined black existence uh, in, in our entire time in this country. It's a tightrope that we continue to walk. And I think um, Mamie Till Mobley's uh, recitation of her conversation with her son is is something that could have happened today still uh, in almost any context in this country. And you know, what Janae has just said is, and uh, I can't emphasize this enough, is what you see depends on where you stand. I, I mean this metaphorically. I didn't have any reference in the book to the talk, right? Because I never had the talk. I repeated the words that maybe Till had, you know, I, I underscored them. I thought they were significant. But in terms of the talk, I never had the talk, right? And because of that, it, it wasn't something that was part of the narrative as I originally wrote it. And I think this is the importance about having communication along race lines and open and uninhibited, you know? And I think uh, this is exactly what Bobby Rush and... Uh, uh, Lonnie Bunch, the Secretary of the Smithsonian, are calling for, you know, in the uh, in the forward in the introduction to this book, which I was so honored. And I just want a big, a big shout out to uh, Congressman Rush and Secretary Lonnie Bunch for first taking the time that they did and writing the incredible things they did. And if you read nothing else in the book, read those, read that forward by the Congressman and that uh, introduction by the Secretary. And I, I was deeply uh, honored that they did that. Absolutely. Both of those are very, very powerful, uh, very, very powerful writings. Um, you know, just to bring in some audience questions here, Ron, uh, David Scober asks, you know, there are many books that have been published about the Till murder and aftermath. What is unique about your book that distinguishes it from uh, volumes written in the past? Well, uh, my background is in, in law. I mean, a lot had been written about Emmett Till, right? I mean, I I had gone on a, a on a civil rights tour uh, uh, four years ago. I found myself in the courtroom uh, where it happened, and I was just I didn't plan to write a book on Emma Till. I just I was in the courtroom and somebody spoke about the trial for about eight minutes and then went on. And I went home that night and I was just on the internet and it was the I couldn't stop. I just I mean, and so what I thought uh, I could do was I could write about something at length that nobody else had done, and that is the trial. Not just, you know, it was an all-white male jury. It was 67 minutes. They had a soda break, you know, begin a story, end of story. This was the primary document that really needed to be elaborated upon, that needed to be analyzed, that needed to be complete, that needed to be uh, uh, fully uh, discussed. I always say this, it was the hardest book for me, of all the books, the 13 books I've done, it was the hardest one to publish. Publisher after publisher after publisher said, trial transcripts don't sell. And I a big shout out to Carolina Academic Press, one of the nation's leading law book publishers for publishing it and seeing the importance of it. So, uh, you know, I think that perspective, uh, uh, others have done incredible uh, uh, jobs uh, covering uh, Deborah Anderson, Dave Tell, and others have done enormous work on the Emmett Till story. I think what separates uh, what I do from, uh, from their uh, admirable work and the work of others is that the focus here on the law and the trial, and my hope is that whatever else is written over time, this will be the definitive account of the trial. So I think that's really what separates it from everything else. Excellent. Thanks, Ron. And, and maybe another audience question here to you, Janae. This is from an, an anonymous attendee. Um, you know, the specific question is to what extent, if any, did the uh, uh, Department of Justice intervene in the prosecution and trial of Emmett Till? But even more broadly, can you talk a little bit about sort of the, the national government's response to incidents like this, um, you know, in the, you know, in the 20th century leading up to the 1950s, sort of what role, if any, did the national government play? And sort of what was the push and pull between sort of the national government over time and the civil rights movement that eventually allowed us to, you know, make progress on racial equality? Well, I think, you know, uh, Ron, Ron just mentioned that uh, it wasn't until uh, just two years ago, March March 29th of 2022, that President Biden signed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act um, that was introduced in the House by Congressman Bobby Rush. And of course, last year, President Biden also declared the 
Tallahatchie Court uh, County Courthouse where the trial occurred, a national monument. Um, I, I'm not going to suggest that that's the first and only response of the federal government, but it has taken a long time to capture the attention and um, uh, response, adequate response, commensurate response from the national government. We know that the history of lynching in this country um, is is just so vast and sorted and underappreciated. More than 4,700 people were lynched in the United States between 1882 and 1968. And a vast majority of those people uh, were black and none of them were prosecuted. Um, and that tells you that the national government, the Department of Justice, um, you know, frankly, did not act even, you know, uh, uh, to to posthumously prosecute or establish um, these harms in a way that would hopefully deter future crimes. Um, so the Department of Justice now has been doing so much more, and I want to acknowledge uh, the incredible work of its civil rights division, uh, led by a former LDF attorney, uh, who I think is bringing that sensibility to the work, uh, of prosecuting uh, harms against Black communities by law enforcement and, and hate crimes as well. But the government still has quite a ways to go to catch up uh, to doing its job to protect Black communities against this type of uh, uh, racist motivated hate. And um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done historically to acknowledge that part of our history and recognize that even uh, you know, a century later to, to name those atrocities is part of the healing and reconciliation that will be necessary for us to move forward. Thank you, Janae. Um, Ron, another audience question to you. This is from Bob Bauer. Whatever became of Moe's right after the trial? Yeah, a uh, very good question, Bob. Um, he leaves. Uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's very dangerous. Uh, as Janae mentioned, uh, you know, when uh, Willie Reed and Mose Wright and others uh, take the stand, uh, you put yourself uh, in, in a murderous path. And so he leaves, goes to Chicago. But remember, the defendants hadn't been charged with kidnapping. So then there's a grand jury hearing in another jurisdiction. Uh, to, to determine whether or not they should be charged with kidnapping. And he comes back. I mean, can you imagine? You dodge a bullet and then you come back with the possibility that you could catch another one. And he testifies. I mean, the grand jury hearing, it, it's a total sham. Uh, these fellows were, I mean, there was ample evidence, just over the top evidence that they were guilty of kidnapping. They're not charged. And so um, then he leaves, uh, uh, returns to Illinois. Uh, and as Janae said, is one of these unsung heroes. And I think, you know, it's important that people like Mose Wright uh, and Mamie Till uh, uh, Mobley, uh, they belong in the textbooks. I don't know how, it'd be interesting to find out, Janae, uh, how many textbooks mention the Till story. I mean, I just, they obviously, uh, I assume many of them mentioned the Rosa Parks story, some of them trying to water that down or, you know, get it, rid of it altogether. But I think the Till story is really important one. And speaking of the Till story, um, Tom, and if, if I'm t I hope I'm not getting ahead to things, but there was something awful that happened after the trial and it had to do with a Look Magazine story. Can I say a few words about that? Oh, absolutely, Ron, that'd be great. So... <laughs> You know, Simone Weil uh, once said that there are certain evils that are so evil that it takes decades or even centuries before the evil stops. And I think a lot of that is true when it comes to Emmett Till. What could be worse than the not guilty verdict in the murder case? What could be worse than the grand jury not uh, prosecuting these fellows for kidnapping? Well, there was a reporter named William Bradford Huey. And after the trial, now remember, the defendants have found not guilty of murder. So after the trial, he strikes up a deal with the defendants and their lawyers to get their confessions, all right, and to sell that story. So he, uh, he, believe it or not, he went to the NACP and asked them to help fund this project. I mean, 
it was just incredible. And you'll see why in a second. So he gets the defendants to, quote, confess to murder. He sells the story to Look Magazine. And Look Magazine in 1956 sells 6 million copies, syndicates it for another 5 million. So in 1956, this story gets 11 million, 11 million copies printed. Fast forward decades. Juan Williams writes a book uh, on, on all of this. And uh, there's a documentary that's made. And that story that William Bradford Huey is repeated. And in the opening scenes of Eyes on the Prize, which is based on Juan Williams's book, uh, William Bradford Huey appears. The problem, which Juan Williams and the makers of the documentary didn't know, is that half of what he said was just a lie. Why was it a lie? Well, when he was writing, remember, the defense lawyers have control of the content. So before he turns anything over to Look Magazine, they control the content. So when he says, well, where did the murder occur? Well, it occurred, uh, you know, at the home of, at the, at the shed of J.W. Uh, Bryan's uh, brother. Well, we can't mention that because he could be prosecuted. Well, whose truck was used? Well, we can't mention that because he could be prosecuted. Well, who helped load the body on the truck, on the pickup? We can't mention that. And so he had to whitewash time and again, you know, and, and leave so many things out and give misinterpretations. This is the evil that continues. And you think about a documentary as important as Eyes on the Prize. And here you have this fellow that perpetuates a lie that to this day continues. And so part of what I try to do in that is in, in Tragedy on Trial is to take the various things that he left out, the various things that were just lies that were in there. And by the way, he has to skirt around kidnapping. So, you know, how did you get the body from point A to point B? Well, they can't mention that because they hadn't been charged with kidnapping. So this is just another example of how an evil, once it starts, it just continues. And that's why the fight to get the story of racial injustice is one that just, it never really ends. And I think, uh, you know, for me, when I looked at, found out about this Look Magazine story, I was just, my breath was taken away. Thomas, can I, can I add to that? I, I wanna build on the first question that asked about how Ron's book can be distinguished and something I said earlier about primary texts and how critical they are particularly in this moment of doubt about truth. And when we know that there are uh, 3,000, over 3,300 instances of individual books being banned. And we know that there's a proliferation of legislation across the country that uh, now regulates how race can be taught in schools. And so Ron, you said we should check and see how many textbooks mention the Till story. It doesn't matter how many mentioned it now. The question is, where are we headed? Will this story continue to be told? Will the important information that you brought to us in your text be allowed to uh, inform how we think about our history and, and how we address issues of race going forward? And I will say that uh, Mississippi in 2022 became the 15th state to pass a law regulating how race is taught in schools and to make sure that certain teachings about race uh, are not brought to children uh, for fear that they will somehow be harmed by it. But what we really know is behind these laws is an effort to uh, erase the truth of this history uh, to, as you mentioned earlier, to whitewash it. And the reason to do that is to make sure that there's no um, effort to hold Mississippi and other actors accountable for the present day effects of some of these past harms and to recognize the context for the inequality that persists today. So it is so important to have these texts and to have these primary sources and to have a unaltered trial transcript that tells the truth of what happened in that courtroom that effectively is an indictment of our, crit our criminal legal system um, because you can't, uh, you can't, challenge the truth and veracity of the words on those pages in that transcript. And that is unfortunately what some of our stories have been reduced to. But it is important that we do not abandon um, the fight to tell the truth and to help to tell the whole context of history. And that is what this important book helps to do. And by the way, uh, 
if anybody hasn't heard the song by Nina Simone, Mississippi Goddamn, you, <laughs> I strongly recommend it. It just a woman that just brought the passion and rage and what have you uh, to what was going on in Mississippi, both with uh, Emmett Till and Medgar Evers. It's just a really powerful uh, song. Absolutely, thank you, thank you, Ron. And you know, Jenna, just building on your 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 uh, your response there about uh, the importance of national memory when it comes to things like Emmett Till's Till story. Uh, you know, you mentioned it earlier that, you know, uh, the Tallahatchie County Courthouse was recently, uh, where, where the Emmett Till trial occurred, was recently named a national monument. Can you talk about the importance of the, the role that national shrines like that might play in helping to tell the story of not just Emmett Till, but more broadly, um, the battle for racial equality over time? Yeah, monuments are a, a powerful, powerful national expression of identity. Uh, they help convey a narrative that reflects, you know, the deeper experiences of, of the people they represent or uh, the events that they represent and, and by whom and the purpose of erecting them. So situating these monuments in public spaces allows us not to ignore this history. It, it instigates and invites curiosity. I love that Ron was on a tour and happened to hear more about the trial and that then gave birth to this phenomenal text. We can't afford to uh, ignore or uh, you know fail to remember these important moments of our history. And the way to do that is to live with them among us. But what we choose to lionize is incredibly important about what we're saying about who we are and who we aspire to be, which is why there is such controversy around Confederate monuments. It's, it's not to suggest that we should ignore that aspect of our history, but do we valorize it is the real question. And by naming this courthouse a national monument, by having representations of this Till trial and, and the family as part of that uh, conversation, we are saying, one, we are expressing a, a degree of sympathy and grief along with the Till family, uh, but we're also acknowledging as a nation that this was a harm and a wrong and asking that we don't forget that so that it is not repeated. I, I think that memorials and monuments um, are, are just, we see them used in so many powerful ways in other countries that the United States has not yet I think fully grasped. And there is a growing movement to do that with a sensibility about how it helps us define our identity and our future going forward. Of course, the monument story cuts two ways. So if one stands in front of that courthouse, off to the left, there's a Confederate monument, mm -hmm. all right, to those that fought the great cause that will never die, something to that effect. And it raises the question, should that monument be brought down, all right, as it or should it remain there to kind of let people feel and see the kind of the racism that was existing at the time and that just continued? I, by the way, I want to give a shout out to very to Patrick Weems and a group that he works with called the Emmett Till Interpretive Center, and they're doing just phenomenal work and have been doing phenomenal work in connection with the courthouse and and what happened there. And I urge people to uh, you know go on a civil rights tour, come to the uh, to that courthouse. Uh, because, like I said, it wasn't until I was actually there, you know, in there. I mean, I'd written about the Emmett Till story in the Baltimore Sun in the 1990s, uh, but it wasn't until I was actually there uh, in that courtroom that somehow I was moved uh, to uh, to write uh, uh, Tragedy on Trial. Excellent. Thanks. And so, Ron, one question we have from a few people in the Q and A here. Uh, this one's a version of it's from Ken Bird. Uh, Ken Bird about the kidnapping charges. You know, if the defendants confessed to kidnapping, why not bring that charge? Can you talk a little bit about the kidnapping part of the yeah. case and what became of that. Sheriff Smith, another sheriff, when he had arrested uh, Roy Bryant, confessed to kidnapping. Uh, J. W. Milan, when he came down, uh, 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 did as much as as well. Uh, what had happened was that the sheriff, Sheriff Strider, this man is so evil. I, I just, he had claimed jurisdiction over the body. He said that the murder occurred in my jurisdiction, which he didn't, and the kidnapping occurred in another jurisdiction. So they had to split jurisdictions. 
All right. So they were only, although they were arrested for kidnapping and murder, they were only charged with murder. Then after that, uh, after the non-guilty verdict for murder, uh, sometime later, uh, a grand jury was convened in LaFleur County. And the evidence against the defendants on kidnapping was overwhelming, overwhelming. And that this grand jury, you know, uh, didn't bat an eye. Uh, was is shocking. But as Jason Downs had mentioned in an, in an earlier interview I did with him, um, the easiest way to prove murder, and, Janae, you, you, and and Tom, you know this, is the felony murder rule. If there's an underlying felony, like kidnapping, all right, and the death occurs, you don't have to show intent to murder. All you have to do is show that there was a kidnapping and in the process of the kidnapping, the death occurred. That never happened, all right, because it was derailed from the outset. And the reporters for the African-American press, they knew all of this. They knew that the sheriff, you know, was lying and what have you. And that's why those accounts, and Janae mentioned that they're um, stored at, among other places, primarily at Howard, are so vital because they really kind of give you uh, a perspective that was otherwise lost to history. And I think, you know, this is why um, writing, like I said at the beginning, the dead live on the lips of the living, you know? And you kind of all of a sudden, by the way, Jesse Jackson said of the um, Emmett Till funeral, uh, the open casket funeral, at the, he referred to it as Emmett resurrecting. And I, I love the I love the the metaphor. I mean, and, and that's really what history does is, you know, that when you let it come out and sometimes it's difficult to deal with, you know, it, it, it's very hard to deal with it. But uh, I, I think you know, as a nation committed to democracy and as a nation committed to justice, assuming we continue to be that, uh, this is a struggle that I don't think will ever end, but it's important. It, it defines not only who we are, but what we might aspire to be. Thank you, Ron. And as we come to the end of our conversation here, you know, a, a, a final question to you, Janae. It's a pretty broad one, but I mean, are there what are, what are sort of what's like what are some closing thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with when it comes to the tragedy of Emmett Till? Uh, that is a broad question, and there's so many. Um, I, I think it is. I would say it is important that we continue to relive these stories uh, because. As Ron said at the very beginning, these stories are not just ones of tragedy and pain, that is for sure and for certain, but also ones of heroism and grace. Uh, and they help us see the bravery that we all should aspire to uh, in, in moments of, of pain and challenge. So telling these stories should be understood as not only a method of, of healing and um, trying to resolve so many of the open wounds that persist in our society, but they really need to be cast differently than, than what is currently happening, that they are divisive concepts or they cause anguish and pain uh, in people. They can be understood as a means of celebrating the progress that our country has made uh, and the progress that is still unfinished, that needs to occur and has to be informed by history and a true account of what happened. So that's what I think is most important to remember about the Till story, to remember that he is a child, uh, was a child whose life was cut short in the most brutal fashion, uh, and that his story is not one that uh, we can be confident would not be repeated today. And it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that we do get to a point where this type of tragedy is unfathomable in this country. Beautifully put, Janae, and that's an excellent way to end this, you know, interesting, inspiring, tragic, you know, really so many emotions wrapped up in this conversation. Ronald Collins, Janae Nelson, thank you so much for joining us and uh, 